بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتذل بها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى طاعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وتبلغنا به كرامة الدنيا والآخرة اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه We ask the Almighty Allah to hasten the reappearance of our master and imam Al-Imam Al-Mahdi Ajjallahu Ta'ala Farajah We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to make us all amongst the sincere supporters and servants of our Imam We ask Allah to give us the tawfiq, the success along with our families and friends to establish justice for that is the goal of our Imam to establish justice at the individual level at the family level at the social level, at the economic level, at the global level. We ask Allah to give us this honor and not to take it away from us. So inshallah now we will begin the program. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أيها الإخوة الكرام الأخوات الكريمات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله you and your families have been keeping safe I ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to protect you all and I ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to illuminate our hearts and minds with the wisdom of Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them, with the nur and the light of the Holy Qur'an. If we seek closeness to the path of Ahl al-Bayt, we will know how to worship Allah the way He wants. Their life, their biography illuminates our hearts, our souls, our minds. In our discussion this evening, we will examine the life of Al-Imam Ali ibn al-Husayn Zayn al-Abideen salawatullahi alayhi. This shining star of Ahl al-Bayt, the fourth Imam of Ahl al-Bayt. He is the surviving son of Al-Imam Abi Abdullah al-Husayn alayhi salam. There is so much to learn from the legacy of Al-Imam Zayn al-Abideen, especially during these days as we are seeing global protests against racism, there's a lot to learn from the legacy of Al-Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam. Al-Imam Ali ibn al-Husayn, Zayn al-Abideen, his name is Ali, the son of Husayn. However, one of his very well-known titles is Zayn al-Abideen. Zayn al-Abideen in Arabic means the adornment or the crown of worshippers. The Imam was known for his acts of worship, his long sujood. He is the adornment of all worshippers. He is at the front forefront when it comes to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam, according to historical reports, was born on the fifth of the month of Sha'ban year 38 after the hijrah this is about two years before the martyrdom of imam ali so imam zayn al-abideen met his grandfather amir al-mu'mineen alayhi salam only for two short years so his father is imam al Hussein. who's his mother when we examine the mother of imam zayn al-abideen we find something interesting and quite unprecedented amongst those Arab families and especially the Bani Hashim. 
the mother of Imam Zain al Abidin was a Persian lady. She came from Persia. Some historical accounts demonstrate that she was the daughter of the Persian king Yazdijurd. Her title was Shah Zanan, the queen of women. She was a very noble lady whom Imam al Hussein married in the city of Medina. Now, this marriage was unprecedented because noble Arab tribes would avoid marrying non-Arab women. So a woman from Persia was considered non-Arab. And you know how the Arabs at the time had this racist, tribalist mentality. They kept away from marrying non-Arab women. Now, Imam al Hussein comes from a noble family. He's the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He marries a non-Arab woman. And this served as a shock for that Arabic community in the city of Medina and in those, in, in those surrounding areas. Because the reality is Arabs perceived themselves to be superior to other races. I'm not going to marry a woman from uh, you know, another race. I'm not going to do that. That lowers my status. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam wanted to shatter these barriers of racism. Everyone's equal in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's your good deeds that make you stand out, that make you higher in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Al Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam comes from Arabic ancestry and also Persian ancestry. This was a beautiful example that Imam Hussein set for his community. And by the way, we find after this marriage, many Arabs were encouraged to marry outside of their race. They were thinking if Imam Hussein alayhi salam did that, then he's the master of the youth of paradise. He's the grandson of the prophet. Then this must be something that's good. Until today, my dear brothers and sisters, we have this tribalist mentality in many of our families. I'm being very frank and open with you. Many of our fam families are not open to marriages with other cultures, with other races. Many times I get complaints from the youth. Say it. I'm interested in this person. His akhlaq impeccable. Everyone testifies to this person's akhlaq. He, he or she is a person of faith. But let's say I come from this race, he or she comes from this race, my parents don't accept. If we want to follow the path of Ahlul Bayt, my dear brothers and sisters, we have to remove these barriers. I can't just claim to follow Imam Hussein alayhi salam through my words, okay? Show your actions. I understand that it may be more convenient, practical to marry someone from your own race. And many times that may be the appropriate thing to do. But sometimes if your son, if your daughter meets someone who's really good, they have an excellent character, they have good akhlaq, they are people of faith, they're committed to their religion. And you simply want to object to this marriage because they're from a different race. That's wrong. Allah created us differently so we come to, one, to know one another. Allah says we've made you into nations and tribes so you can come to know one another. That's the beauty of God's creation, to appreciate this diversity. Why are we stuck on the idea that I have to marry someone from my village? Not even my country, my village. <laughs> you know, two years ago, a brother told me, say it, my friend went to propose. So he had me as the middleman to go to this family and propose on his behalf. So I went to the father of the girl. I told him, this person is interested in proposing to your daughter. The father asked two questions. Look at this mentality. It's a common mentality in our communities. He asked two questions. Number one, tell me how much money does he make? How much money does he have now in his bank account? Number two, which village is he from? He knew the country. They were from the same country. No, 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 no. Which daya? Which village is he from? You think if this person is from your daya, 
just because he's from your daya, he's going to make your daughter happy. This careless father, this irresponsible father, did not care to ask about his character. How's his character? How's his akhlaq? How's his truthfulness, honesty, integrity, reputation in the community? You know, how's his religiosity? He did not care. Money and the village. That's all. You see this tribalist mentality? We claim to be Muslims, my dear brothers and sisters. But how much of Islam do we practice? So the mother of Aliman Zain al-Abidin came from a non-Arabic background. Her title is Shah Zanan. She's also known uh, in the Hadith Shah Banu Wayne or Shah Banu. She was a very noble lady. Imam al Hussein loved her dearly. In fact, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, would often remind his son, Al Imam al Hussein, how special this lady is. Take care of her. She's indeed a special lady. Not that Imam Ali would think that Imam Hussein would not take care of her, but Imam Ali is teaching us is teaching the fathers of our community to show respect to someone if they're from a different culture. Treat them as if they are your own. Don't be racist. Don't be tribalist. Now, unfortunately, Imam Zain al-Abideen did not have the opportunity to grow up with his mother. Because when she, um, when she delivered, just days after the delivery, you know, during the nifas, the postpartum bleeding, she uh, passed away. She became ill, extremely ill, and just days, within a few days after delivering Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen, she passed away. So Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen did not grow up with his mother. He grew up under the care of his father, Al-Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. So Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam grew up in the city of Medina. He, for two years, met his grandfather Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then for a number of years, he grew up under the leadership of his uncle, Al-Imam Al-Hassan salam. And then after Al-Imam Al-Hassan, he grew up under the leadership of his father, Al-Imam Abu Abdullah Al-Hussein Salawatullahi Alayhi. When we examine the life of Al-Imam Zain Al-Abideen salam, we find that he stands out in a number of areas. One of the areas in which Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen would stand out in was his amazing respect for people from other races and people from other colors. And this is a point I would like to explore in depth today. We know of Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen during the Battle of Karbala and what happened in Karbala. We've heard some of the stories. But we do not know much about him when it comes to after Karbala. What was Imam Zain al-Abideen doing after Karbala? Remember, the Imam lived over 30 years after Karbala. He was martyred in the year 94 or 95 after the Hijrah. The Battle of Karbala took place year 61. So we're talking about 34 years after Karbala. What did the Imam do after Imam Hussein? to guide the Muslim Ummah. One of the main projects of Imam Zain al-Abideen was to end racism, protect the rights of slaves and end slavery. Therefore, we find that Imam Zain al-Abideen spent many of his days and years in what I call the slave project. At the time, slaves especially African slaves, they were not even treated second-class citizens, not even second-class, subhuman. Some of those racist Arab rulers, like Muawiyah and others, they would always look down upon the slaves. In fact, Muawiyah, in his will to Yazid, he specifically tells him how to marginalize slaves. Make sure they don't get educated because Muawiyah knew very well that if slaves have access to education, then they will be empowered. They will um, go on their way to liberty and freedom. So he instituted a policy where slaves could not really get education. He would tell his son Yazid, give them high-risk jobs. All those dangerous jobs in society, 
let them do it. That way, their mortality rate, their life expectancy will be less. This was the mentality of Bani Umayyah, my dear brothers and sisters. They were extremely racist. Imam Zayn al-Abideen was living in a racist environment. When the leader of the Muslim Ummah says that, the corrupt leader, of course, Muawiyah, what do you expect from the average citizen? So the Imam wanted to shatter that. What did he do? The Imam السلام, according to some historical reports, throughout his lifetime, he purchased 100,000 slaves. Slavery existed at the time. Islam put steps to liberate the slaves, but at the, but at the time, slaves did exist. These corrupt rulers would wage wars here and there, and they would enslave people. And Imam Zayn al-Abideen bought 100,000 slaves over the course of these three decades. You know what he would do? And Imam Zayn al-Abideen would educate those slaves. He'd teach them how to read, how to write. He would give them religious knowledge, academic knowledge. He would teach them an occupation, give them a moment to learn. Then the Imam السلام, usually after a year, he would free them. He would emancipate them. Then he would dispatch them to all corners of the Muslim world. And he would tell them, take the akhlaq of Al Muhammad and spread it in your society. Take the true teachings of the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad and spread it in society. My dear brothers and sisters, why do you think Islam spread in Africa? Seriously, why? The Arabs were racist against Africans. Muawiyah and his racism, Yazid and his racism, and the Umayyad rulers. Why do you think in their era, Islam spread to Africa? Because when you are looked down upon, when there's racism against you, that does not encourage you to follow you know, the, the religion of these racist people. What is it that attracted many African nations to the religion of Islam at the time of Imam Zayn al-Abideen? It's those slaves that Imam Zayn al-Abideen, he would educate them, then he would free them. They would go and they would take the teachings of Islam to those regions. And the Africans were inspired by this. They really were inspired by this. And that's why you find in the later Imams of Ahlul Bayt, Al Imam Al Jawad, Al Imam Al Rada, Al Imam Al Hadi, their mothers were African. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt wanted to shatter racism. The most powerful way to do that was to go and marry from those African nations, especially Northern Africa at the time, because it was closer to Arabia. The people were shocked. These Imams are marrying African women? We would never do something like that. But the Imams wanted to make it a point that everyone's equal in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we find at the time of Imam Zayn al-Abidin al-Islam, through these slaves, Islam was spreading in Africa. Now you may wonder, how did Imam Zayn al-Abidin al-Islam fund the slave project? Because buying a slave from a slave market was, was not cheap. Those slave owners would charge a lot of money for them. If you remember from our previous discussions, Imam Ali السلام, during those 25 years in which he was marginalized, what did he do? Remember we talked about the farmlands that he developed and he planted 100,000 trees on the western coast of Hijaz, modern day Saudi Arabia. And then Imam Hassan and Hussein, they inherited that farmland. They would use the money that's generated from those farmlands to help the poor. Imam Zayn al-Abidin inherited this. So he would use the money from that farmland to buy slaves, educate them, and then he would free them. Imam Zayn al-Abideen freed 100,000 slaves in his life. Allahu Akbar. Can you imagine, my dear brothers and sisters? Is this something that you know about your Imam? Today, let the world hear this, my dear brothers and sisters. Believe me, the world don't know anything about the Ahlul Bayt. If they knew, they would follow them. Your Imam, in those times, there were no rights. There was so much racism. He took it upon himself to emancipate and liberate 100,000 slaves, most of whom were from Africa. And you know, when the Imam would free them, and he would tell them, okay, now 
go to your original village, wherever they brought you from, you know they would cry? They couldn't let go of Imam Sayyid al-Abideen. They told him, our dear Imam, we spent a beautiful year with you, hearing your du'as, you teaching us. You're like a father figure to us. Not one day did you yell at us. Not one day did you make us feel inferior. We cannot leave you. Some of those slaves begged Imam Zain al not to free them. They would beg him. Have you seen a slave begging his master, don't free me, don't free me? I want to stay with you. But the Imam said, no, it's time that you move on. You go back to your villages and you spread the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam Zain al was amazingly gentle with his slaves. Never he would yell at them. Even if sometimes he would give them a task, they don't follow through. The Imam was very gentle. To give you an image of how the Imam would treat some of those slaves or the servants in his house, one hadith tells us one day a female maid, a maid, a female slave in the house of the imam, she was watering something. So she passed by an imam Zain al Abidin carrying an ibriq. Ibriq is basically like a water can, it's a container of water. She accidentally hit an imam Zain al Abidin with this water can, such that the edge of this water can injured the imam. He started to bleed. Now imagine at the time, a slave does this to his master. You accidentally injure your master. What would happen to you? So she kind of got scared, you know, this is something big. I, I hurt my master. I injured his face. I injured his body. But she was educated to memorize verses of the Quran because she grew up in the house of Imamah. So you know what she said? She read that verse that describes the believers as suppressing their anger. The Imam السلام, told her, Don't worry, I've suppressed my anger. I'm not going to be angry with you. She continued the verse, And the believers are those who forgive people. The Imam says, I have forgiven you. Then she concluded the verse by saying, Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. And Allah loves the good doers. You know what the Imam Zain al did? The Imam says, I will show you Ihsan. Now that you quoted this verse, I will show you goodness and Ihsan. I have freed you. Go, you are free in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was the akhlaq of the Imam Zain al -Abidin. Another historical account tells us one day one of his slaves, the Imam called him. You know, he called him by name so and so. He didn't respond. He called him twice, he didn't respond. He called him three times, he didn't respond. Then after three times, he responded. The Imam told him, are you okay? How come you're not responding? The Imam, uh, the, the slave told the Imam salam, I want to try your tolerance. Because other masters, when they call their slaves once, they don't answer, they beat them. I want to try your patience. I want to see what Ali ibn Hussein is going to do with his slave if he doesn't answer him three times. And Imam Zain al salam, he basically showed him the best of akhlaq. He smiled to him. He did not punish him. He did not reprimand him. Because the Imam considered him like his brother. Yeah, maybe society considers you a slave, but I see you as my brother. You're like my own family. You're like my own children. He was truly a father figure to them. My dear brothers and sisters, today we are witnessing protests around the country after the death, the tragic death of George Floyd. You all saw that horrifying clip, the white officer suffocating with his knees, kneeling on him and suffocating him to death. And he, and he was crying, I cannot breathe, I can't breathe, I want some water. He kept begging, for nine minutes, that ruthless officer, he suffocated George Floyd to his death. Now America is in outrage because pol police, police brutality against people of color, especially blacks, and institutional racism against blacks is something that happens every day in America. All around the US, this happens. Sometimes it's caught on camera. 
if George Floyd's death was not caught on camera, nothing would have happened. But the camera was there to show the world what kind of injustice happens. But this happens so often. Every day this happens somewhere, my dear brothers and sisters. There's a lot of racism in this country. There's a lot of racism in our societies. And I have to be very honest with you, even in Muslim families, my dear brothers and sisters, you find racism. When you find us talking about other races, other people, people of color, whether it's blacks or other races, we feel that superiority, right? Even though you may not verbally state it or utter it, but the racism is there. It's embedded in our families. As we are experiencing these protests in America and around the world, we Muslims have to go back to our roots. We have to be true to the message of Islam. If you find in your heart racism, if you find any bigotry against blacks, know that the mothers of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt, a number of our Imams, the mothers had African ancestry. How can I claim to follow Imam al-Rida, Imam al-Jawad, Imam al-Hadi, Imam al-Askari when I have racism against people from African descent, when I don't treat them as my own brothers and sisters? Let's go back to the message of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Prophet Muhammad tried to shatter all barriers, all racial barriers. The Prophet did his best. You know, Al-Miqdad ibn al-Aswad, Al-Miqdad ibn Amr, he was one of the great companions of the Prophet But he came from a tribe that the Arabs, you know, belittled, they underestimated. So in Medina, he wanted to get married. He went to a number of companions proposing, they rejected him. He went to Umar ibn al-Khattab, he rejected him. He said, no, I'm not going to give you uh, you know, my daughter. Uh, he went to Abdurrahman ibn Auf, a number of the companions. A number of the companions he went to propose, but they rejected him. The Prophet saw him. He was distressed. He was upset. The Prophet told him, what's the matter, Ya Miqdad? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm proposing these companions reject me. They're racist. They consider me from a lower tribe, a lower race, and they're not accepting me. The Prophet said, go and propose to my cousin, Zuba'a. Zuba'a, the daughter of Zubayr, she was the cousin of the Prophet. She comes from the Bani Hashim. You see, when the Prophet would preach, he'd start with his own family. It's easy for me to get up on the pulpit and say, hey, people, remove these racial barriers and, and go marry people of color. But am I willing for this to happen to my own family? The Prophet started with his own family. He told Al-Miqdad, I will talk to Duba'a. And he ended up marrying Duba'a. Now Duba'a initially, she didn't like this, you know, but the Prophet urged her to do that. You see that the Prophet ﷺ encouraged Bani Hashim to marry people from other races, from other tribes, even if they're lower tribes, it's okay. Al-Miqdad was a man of faith. He was one of the best companions of the Prophet Look at his akhlaq, look at his deen, look at his religion. We have this problem in our communities, my dear brothers and sisters. We have to show respect to people of uh, other races. In fact, in some cultures, in some Arab cultures, when they want to refer to someone who's black or Afri African American, they, they use the word abid or abid. You know, abid came, abid came. That's derogatory. I know they don't have ill intentions. I'm not judging their intentions, but it's wrong to use these words, my dear brothers and sisters. Abid means slave. Why are you calling this person a slave? And by the way, if you look at the history of slavery in the United States, uh, Dr. Um, Sal Harris, he's uh, a professor in Virginia, he has studied the lives of those slaves who were forcibly shipped from Africa to the U.S. Do you know, my dear brothers and sisters, many of those African uh, slaves who were enslaved forcefully by those whites, many of them died on the way, many of them here in America, they had to go through excruciating injustice
through difficult circumstances. Many of them were Muslim. Many of the original slaves here in America were actually Muslim. There are records, historical records of them praying secretly, doing salah secretly, because their masters were Christians, so they forced them to give up their religion of Islam and to become Christians. Many of them had to pray secretly. And then institutional racism carries from one generation to another generation. Many of them are impoverished. Many of them grow up in rough neighborhoods, neighborhoods that are ravaged by drugs, by violence. Many of them don't have the opportunities that you have, that others have. And this carries on for generations. We must stand up and speak. As Muslims, let's go to our religion of Islam, my dear brothers and sisters. Honor your Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam by honoring people of color, by truly treating them as your brothers and sisters, by reaching out to them, showing them their, our humanity. So this was one of the great achievements of Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen, salawatullahi alayhi. Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen, he educated, empowered, and liberated 100,000 slaves. Let's remember that. So this was one achievement of Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen after Karbala. Remember that the Umayyad dynasty had a close eye on Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen. So he had to use low-profile ways to educate the Ummah. This was a genius method. Because, you know, the, the Umayyad rulers, from their perspective, they were, you know, they saw Imam Zain al-Abideen spending time with these slaves. Who cares? Let him waste his time with these slaves. But little did they know that Imam Zain al-Abideen was saving Islam and the path of Ahlul Bayt through these slaves. He was educating them. And that's how he supported the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's one way how Imam Zain al-Abideen saved the religion of Islam after Karbala. A second way, my dear brothers and sisters, was through supplication. The Imam realized that the Ummah had become so corrupt during the time of the Umayyads. Corruption was pervasive in society. It was all around the Muslim Ummah. Moral corruption. So the Imam alayhi salam resorted to dua to elevate his community spiritually. That's why you find some of our most beautiful duas from Imam Zain al-Abideen. In the Shah, in Shah Ramadan, did you not recite dua Abi Hamza Thimali? This dua is from Imam Zain al-Abideen. He taught this dua to one of his good companions, Abu Hamza al-Thimali. So through dua, the Imam alayhi salam educated the masses. See, the Imam couldn't go out there and openly give a sermon because the Umayyads would have killed him. They told him, stay put, you're not allowed to teach. So the Imam السلام, would teach the people through dua. That's why if you study the duas of Imam Zain al-Abidin, not only you know, does the Imam show you how to reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Imam gives you a good dose of spirituality, but the Imam gives you the proper ideas, good ideology, healthy ideas, good belief system. Study the du'as of Imam Zain al-Abidin. You find amazing wisdom in those du'as. So this was one way in which Imam Zain al-Abidin salam he elevated the status of the Muslim Ummah through as sahifa al-Sajjadiyya. Read as sahifa al-Sajjadiyya, my dear brothers and sisters. There's over 50 supplications in as sahifa al-Sajjadiyya. Beautiful du'as. Read them one by one. And the Imam has a dua for everything. Dua for your parents, for your family, for your children, for brothers and sisters, duas from illnesses, uh, duas to seek closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dua for your neighbor, dua for everything around you in society. Beautiful duas. Know them, memorize them, read them. And then we find that Imam Zain al-Abideen also contributing to humanity through Risalat al huquq He has a treatise on rights. The Imam alayhi salam taught his companions what rights are. Today, you know, the West boasts about the United Nations. We established this organization to look after human rights. 13 centuries ago, Al Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam, he instituted a system of rights. 
Read Risalat al-Hukuk. Study it, my dear brothers and sisters. You find that Imam Zain al-Abidin teaches you everything around you has a right over you. You know, the Western mentality of rights is that what are my rights? What's in it for me? Usually we think of it in an individualistic way. Sometimes it's selfish. And Imam Zain al-Abidin teaches you, no. What are the rights you have to observe? towards your parents, business partners, other people in society, towards Allah. The Imam beautifully talks about the body parts. You know every body part has a right. The Imam teaches you in Rasalat al-Hukuq, your body does not belong to you, belongs to Allah. You don't have the right to harm your body. Your eyes have a right over you. Your ears have a right over you. Your tongue has a right over you. Imagine if you see the world from the lens of rights. People will behave. It will be a much better society. And through the system of rights, the Imam gave dignity to the poor, to the marginalized, to the oppressed. The Imam, السلام, you know what he teaches you? When you give money to the poor, usually, in your heart at least, you feel like you're doing the poor a favor, right? Even if you're a humble, generous person, and you don't say that, sometimes we have that feeling. And Imam Zain al-Abidin teaches you, no, that poor person, by them accepting your charity, they did you a favor, not the other way around. Why? Because Allah has imposed on you the right of giving to the poor. That poor person helped you fulfill this right. So you're indebted to that poor person. Allah Akbar, can you show me such philosophy elsewhere, my dear brothers and sisters? Look at the dignity Ali Imam Zain al-Abidin gave to the poor. When you give them, you thank them. Tell them, look, I have an obligation to give my zakat, my khums, my kafara, whatever it is. I have an obligation to release myself from this obligation. I have to give charity. By you taking my charity, you helped me fulfill this obligation. So thank you. See how the Imam gives us a new perspective to rights. It's a beautiful treatise on rights. The rights of your teacher, the rights of your children, the rights of your spouse. He talks to masters and the rights that the slaves have over their masters. And in and, and that era, in that time, slaves had no rights, even in Europe. They were considered animals in some of these European countries. Go and read history, my dear brothers and sisters. In London, in the UK, they would put an African woman in a zoo to show that she resembles apes. This is in Europe, my dear brothers and sisters. This is in Europe. We forgot this history. Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam, 14, 13 centuries ago, he rejected this type of racism. They have rights over you. They're humans just like you. In fact, they can be better than you if their deeds are better than yours. That's the dignity Al Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam gave to everyone. Through Risalat al hukuk study this treatise on rights. Honor the legacy of Imam Zain al-Abidin by learning about his teachings. And then my dear brothers and sisters, one dimension of Imam Zain al-Abidin's life is the tragedy of Karbala. Imam Zain al-Abidin was 22 years old at the battle of Karbala. On his way to Karbala, Imam Zain al-Abidin fell extremely ill. Before they arrived in Karbala, Imam Zain Abidin had become ill. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through his divine plan, he allowed Imam Zain Abidin to become ill to protect him. Because if Imam Zain Abidin was not ill, it was his duty to defend his father, Imam Hussein, and the women and children. And the enemies would have killed him. But Allah wants to continue the line of Imam. So Allah had him become ill to protect him. On the day of Ashura, when Imam Zain al-Abidin heard, heard his father, Allah al min nasirin yansuruni, Allah al min mu'inin yu'inuni. Is there anyone to help me? Is there anyone to defend these women? Imam Zain al-Abidin, he started to shake. He couldn't take it any longer. Longer, He said, bring me a stick so I can stand. I'm too ill and bring me my sword. I have to go and defend my father. Imam al Hussein came, he told him, my dear son, you have to obey the command of Allah. If you die, 
the Hujja of God, the Imam on earth, will no longer be present. You must stay alive after me to carry the legacy of Islam. You're not allowed to fight. Go back to your tents. But Imam Zain al-Abidin, he experienced a major tragedy in the land of Karbala. Seeing his father, seeing his brothers, his older brother, Ali ibn Akbar was older than Imam Zain al-Abidin. He saw him massacred. He saw the six-month-old baby brother being massacred. And then they were taken as captives, as prisoners of war to Kufa, to Sham. By the way, three days after Imam Hussain was martyred, Imam Zain Abidin miraculously, by the permission of Allah, he came back to Karbala. And he is the one who, with the help of the tribe of Banu Asad, he buried the bodies. And he's the one who prayed on the body of Imam al Hussein. Because only an Imam can pray on the body of an Imam. So they took them to Sham. And Imam Zain al Abidin tells us the worst moment in his life, the most difficult stage in his life was Asham. Asham, Asham, Asham. What did they do to the Ahlul Bayt? Taking them as prisoners of war, humiliating them. They kept them at the gate of Sham for three days under the sun. Yazid said, keep them three days like slaves under the sun to humiliate them. Sahl ibn Sa'd al-Sa'di was one of the companions of the Prophet. One of the last living companions of the Prophet. It was very old. He came to Sham. He narrates a very touching moment. He said, I saw the family of the Ahlul Bayt paraded like slaves, like captives of war in the streets of Sham. I went and I saw a young man, very frail, and the, the chains, the iron shackles and chains were around him. I told him, Ya Rasulullah, I am Sahl ibn Sa'd al-Sa'adi. I met your grandfather, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I'm one of his companions. Can I do anything for you? He said, yes, Ya Sa'd, Ya Sahl. I ask you for one thing. Do you have an old piece of cloth? Sahl thought maybe Imam Zain al-Abidin wants a new garment. He says, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, you come from a generous family. Why would I give you something cheap, like an old rag? We're also, we should be also be generous like you. I can bring you a new garment. He said, no, I don't want to wear the garment. But this iron chain around my neck is eating my flesh. And it's hurting me throughout the way. I want to put a cloth between my neck and the iron chain. Sahl, he says, I brought an old piece of cloth to Imam Zil Abidin. He lifted the iron chain from his neck and he put the piece of cloth. He says, I could see the blood flowing from the neck of the Imam when he removed the chain. Can you handle it, brothers and sisters? A chain for weeks around your neck to the point where it's eating your flesh. That's how Imam Zain al-Abidin entered the city of Sham. But the Imam gave that powerful sermon in the presence of Yazid and he really shook him up. He shook the foundations of the Umayyad dynasty. It was such an embarrassment for Yazid such that he told Imam Zain al-Abidin, okay, leave, don't stay here in Damascus any longer. If you stay here, probably, there's probably going to be a revolution against me. So he had them go back to Karbala and then from there, to the city of Medina. For 35 years, Imam Zain al-Abidin would cry every single day on, on what happened in Karbala. He resorted through the power of the tears, my dear brothers and sisters, through the power of the tear. Because sometimes when you don't have the freedom to go and openly expose the tyrants, because they will kill you, Sometimes you don't have a very open method, a loud method. You have to use a low profile method. And Imam Zain Abidin, through his tears, he exposed the Umayyads. People would see him cry every day. Why? What happened? They would question, then they would figure out, oh, it's the injustice that's happening. Well, how did Imam Hussein get killed? Why did he get killed? Remember, Bani Umayyah, they had this uh, propaganda machine. The censorship, they did not want people to talk about Imam Hussein's martyrdom. But Imam Zain al-Abidin, through his tears, 
he would remind the world what happened to Imam al Hussein in Karbala. For three decades in Medina, Imam, Imam Zain al-Abidin, every time he would drink a cup of water, he would mix it with his tears. Every time he would eat, he would cry. Every time he would see a sheep being slaughtered, he would cry. And he would face towards Karbala. And he says, Abba Ya Hussein, even the sheep is given water before it's slaughtered, but you were slaughtered thirsty. One day, one of the friends of Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam, he told him, Ya Rasulullah, you've been crying for 30 years. Enough! How much are you going to cry? How much are you going to cry? Isn't it time for you to stop those tears? You know what Imam Zain al-Abideen told him? Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam told him, so and so, Ya Hadha, you're rebuking me because I'm crying? Let me tell you something. Ya'qub and nabi Prophet Ya'qub, the father of Yusuf. He was separated from his son, Yusuf. He cried and cried on his son until the Quran says his eyes became white. He basically lost his vision. And he had other sons. He had 11 sons. He had 11 sons. One of them, one of them, Allah separated from him and he was not dead. Yusuf was alive and Ya'qub knew that Yusuf was alive. Ya'qub cried for 40 years. Ya'qub cried on the separation from Yusuf for 40 years. And Ya'qub is a Nabi. Imam Zain Abi says Ya'qub cried until his hair became white, his back became bent, his eyes became white. Allahu Akbar. وَأَنَا نَظَرْتُ إِلَىٰ أَبِي وَأَخِي وَسَبْعَةَ عَشَرَ مِنْ أَهْلِ بَيْتِي And I, on the day of Ashura, I saw my father. I saw my brothers. I saw 17 members of my family, مُجَزَّرِينَ حَوْلِي They were massacred around me. فَكَيْفَ يَبْقَ ذِي حُسْنِي How do you expect me to forget my sorrow? Ya'qub was separated from one of his sons. He cried 40 years. I saw my, my father, my brothers, my family members massacred around me. You want me to forget that? But it's through the power of the tear that Imam Zain al Abidin, he spread the revolution of Imam al Hussein around the world. People had so much respect for Imam Zain al Abidin. Towards the end of the Imam's life, the evil Umayyad dictator Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, he was ruling. So one day, one year, he comes to the Hajj to Mecca. Hundreds of thousands of Muslims had gone to do the Hajj. Now it's mustahab when you go to Masjid al-Haram to touch the black stone, al-Hajar al-Aswad, right? So Hisham Abdul Malik, he tried to go to the black stone. He can't, it's too crowded. He has an army, he's the Khalifa, he has soldiers. They couldn't make way for him. It was that crowded. So he got upset. He's like, okay. Put me a raised throne, a chair. Let me just look at least. Let me just, you know, take a look and enjoy my view of seeing the Hujjaj in Masjid al-Haram. When he was watching, suddenly Hisham ibn Abdul Malik saw something strange. What did he see? He saw a young man. A young man. Not too old. Maybe, you know, not, not a very old man and a big man. No. A young man, a middle-aged man, he saw him walking and he was walking slowly towards the black stone. When the people, they saw him automatically, they formed a line for him and he went and he touched the black stone. Hisham ibn Abdul Malik was furious. So he said with anger, Man hada? Who's this man? I'm the Khalifa. Nobody made me room. And I've got an army with me. And this young man, he has nobody, no army. And people just automatically formed a line for him and he went and he touched and kissed the black stone. Who is he? Around Hisham ibn Abdul Malik was a very famous poet by the name of Al Farazda. Al Farazda was a poet. He got furious, he couldn't take this any longer. Because Hisham knew who that man was. He knew this is Ali ibn al-Hussein, but out of jealousy and hatred, he said, who is he? 
Otherwise, he knew who al Mamzeh al Abidin is. He said, Man hada. So Al Farazdaq got up and he said his powerful, powerful poetry, which got him in trouble and he was imprisoned because of it. He beautifully said, Who is this? This is a man who the land of Batha, Mecca knows him. The Kaaba knows this man. The sacred area around Mecca knows this man. This is the son of Fatima, if you don't know him. Through his grandfather, Allah sealed all prophets. His grandfather is the final of prophets. You don't know him? You think, oh Khalifa, by saying who is he, this is going to make him any lower, this is going to hurt him? No. Because the Arabs and the non-Arabs know who this man is, which you claim you don't recognize him. It's a beautiful poem, my dear brothers and sisters. He examines the akhlaq of Imam Zain al-Abideen, salawatullahi alayhi. مَا قَالَ لَا قَطُّ إِلَّا فِي تَشَهُّدِهِ لَوْلَ التَّشَهُّدُ كَانَتْ لَا أَهُ نَعَمُ He never said no in his life except in his tashahud because he would say there is no God but Allah. If it weren't for the tashahud, he would not have said no in his life. يَكَادُ يُمْسِكُهُ عَرْفَانُ رَاحَتِهِ He know, he beautifully says when he goes to the black stone, usually you want to touch the black stone. You extend your hand to the black stone. He says it's the opposite with Ali ibn Hussein. It's as if the Kaaba wants to embrace him. If it's, if it, it's as if the black stone wants to embrace him. يَكَادُ يُمْسِكُهُ عَرْفَانُ رَاحَتِهِ رُكْنُ الْحَطِيمِ إِذَا مَا جَاءَ يَسْتَلِمُ Allahu Akbar. Beautiful lines. Hisham became furious. You praise Ali ibn Hussein in my presence? Imprison him. He had him imprisoned. Al Imam Zain Abidin tried to help him. He sent him some money. But this was the status of Al Imam Zain Abidin. Yeah, politically he had no authority, but he commanded the hearts of the people. The people loved him. And until today, my dear brothers and sisters, the legacy. Of Imam Zain al Abidin resonates with us. Let's uphold his legacy. His legacy of dua and supplication. His legacy of ibadah. He would go into sujood sometimes 1,000 times. He would say, La ilaha illallah, haqqan haqqa, ashadu an la ilaha illallah. To the point where he would develop this callus around his forehead, which needed to be cut. Sajjad. Why is he called Sajjad? Because he was the excessive prostrator. Let's carry that legacy of Imam Zain al Let's carry the legacy of tears. Through tears, we can transform ourselves. Let's cry for the oppressed, my dear brothers and sisters. It's not a sign of weakness. When you see injustice around you, cry for injustice. Imam Zain al teaches you to do that. And most importantly, let's carry the legacy of Imam Zain al when it comes to combating racism. And today we are facing an era in which there's a lot of racism. Let's go back to our roots in the religion of Islam. Let's go back to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and dispel all types of racism. Remove it from your heart, from your family, from your society. The world will be a better place, inshallah. Al Imam Zain al Abidin, year 94 or 95 of the Hijrah, on the 25th day of Muharram, he was a Shaheed. The evil ruler of his time, he poisoned him. And the Imam alayhi salam, he died as a martyr. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to illuminate our hearts and our minds with the legacy of Imam Zain al Abidin salawatullahi alayhi. Now we open the floor to any questions that you have. So inshallah, if the brothers or sisters have any questions, feel free to share them now. And inshallah, we'll address them after as salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Wa'ali Muhammad. Thank you, Sayyid. Once again, we are reminded just how relevant the teachings of Ahlul Bayt are. They give us a clear path of faith, justice, and equality. 
So now for our questions, our first question is actually about um, Imam Mahdi alayhi salam. Someone texted to me. Uh, can you explain the first words of the newly born Imam Mahdi, which is Surah 28, verse 5? So the Imam alayhi salam, we believe Al Imam al Mahdi, when he was born, he spoke. I know maybe some might find this difficult to accept, but remember the Quran tells us that Prophet Isa alayhi salam spoke from the cradle. And Al Imam al Mahdi is a chosen leader by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't be surprised if we have hadiths that he spoke. So Al Imam Zain al Abideen alayhi salam, Al Imam uh, al Mahdi ajjalallah wa ta'ala faraja. As soon as he was born, he spoke. First of all, he said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna Muhammad al Rasulullah. He testified uh, to God's oneness that the Prophet is the Prophet from Allah. Then he mentioned the names of all the Imams, from Imam Ali to his father, Al Imam al Askari. And he also uh, recited the verse, Qul ja al haqqu wa qul ja al haqqu wa zahaq al batil. Say the truth has come and battle and falsehood will be going. Because Al-Mahdi is the one who will establish the government of truth. He also recited the verse, وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ مُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَمَّةً وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ الْوَارِثِينَ And we want to bestow upon those who've been marginalized, who are weak in the land, we want to make them inheritors of the land. We want to make them Imams. And this is a reference to the government of Al Imam Al Mahdi Ajrallah Ta'ala Faraja. And then he said, Ya, oh, ya Rabbi Anjizli Ma Wa'attani. Oh Allah, fulfill your promise by one day allowing me to reappear. So, yes, we have accounts of Al Imam Al Mahdi as soon as he was born. He recited these testimonies and he also recited a few verses of the Holy Quran. Thank you, Sayyid. Our second question is, why did the idol worshippers keep Hajar al-Aswad from the time of Prophet Ibrahim, but they removed it? How did it come back to the Kaaba? Yes, so sometimes some Arab tribes would actually try to loot al-Hajar al-Aswad. They did know that there was something special about it. And in fact, they considered it an honor for the city of Mecca to have al-Hajar al-Aswad. Because they had heard from previous nations, from their ancestors, that this is a special stone. And they had also heard about, you know, Prophet Ibrahim السلام, and these other prophets, even though they corrupted the message, but they had heard of those stories. So they knew that the black stone was indeed a precious stone and it would bring barakah. You know, many of them, sometimes when they would go to the stone and they would supplicate to Allah, Allah would grant them their wishes. So they knew it was a precious stone, but sometimes they would loot the stone. And then, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would inspire one of the prophets of the time. Because remember that even though in Arabia, there was no official prophets before Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, but there were local prophets. We believe, for instance, Abdul Muttalib. He was inspired by Allah. Allah sometimes would reveal to him. He'd inspire him in his heart. Abu Talib, we believe the same about him. So those prophets would be inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, find the Hajar al-Aswad and bring it back to uh, the Kaaba. By the way, there was something unique about the Hajar al-Aswad. When it would be taken from the Kaaba, you could not fix it and attach it to the Kaaba unless a prophet of God or a righteous servant of God would do that. This was an interesting observation that the Arabs had. So someone who was not an idol worshiper, someone who was a, a, a muwahid, someone who believed in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they would fix it on the Kaaba, it would stay mounted. Otherwise, if the pagans would put it, it would not be uh, fixed on the Kaaba. Thank you. The next question is pretty long. Um, so I'm just going to read it straight through and you can ask me to repeat anything. Attachments versus uh, disattachments. How does the whole meaning of it's meant to be play within how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has people leave a specific mark in our lives? Part of how we feel about people. Is it something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has planted within us from our youth? The reason we feel a specific way about a person. Is that what Allah wants? 
part of people entering and leaving from our lives. Is that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for us, even regarding how deeply and strongly we feel about it or how it affects us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being with emotions. We are emotional beings. And one natural consequence of emotions is that we develop attachments to those around us, friends, family members, figures in society. They could be historical figures, they could be contemporary figures, and even objects, right? Sometimes you get attached to an object, to a gadget, to a car, to a house, to something, to money. We human beings form attachments. Allah deliberately put this capacity in us in order to try us. Because one of the greatest trials in our lives is to control what we get attached to and to detach ourselves from materialism, number one, and number two, from bad influence. This is our trial in life. I am attached to this dunya, to money, to power, to fame. Can I detach my heart from it? That's my struggle. We need decades to work on ourselves to achieve that. The more we are attached to this dunya, the more we fail our test. We learn from the Imams of Ahl bayt how to let go. If I have to let go for the sake of the truth, am I willing or no? That's how you test yourself to see if you're a true believer or not. Am I willing to let go if I have to, if justice calls on me to, or no? I want to keep these attachments. Sometimes the, the bad friends that we have. I know many friends are attached to their friends. You tell them, Habibi, this person is not a good influence on you. This person will pull you to corruption, to drug addiction, but I'm attached. Or the addictions that we have, we're attached to them. So Allah has given us the capacity to be attached to others. And it's, and it's difficult, but Allah has given us the intellect and willpower. Choose over time what you get attached to. Or if you find yourself being attached to something negative, resist, work on yourself. Don't say, Khalas, I'm a human being, I got attached. You have to rise above these attachments. So yes, sometimes Allah has willed for you to develop attachments. And Allah wants you to rise against those attachments, to struggle. Because if you learn how to break attachments, you're a strong person. Nothing can enslave you. A lot of times there's pressure on us through attachments. Many people give up their faith because of these attachments. A true believer is the one who learns how to navigate the attachments, to choose them wisely, and to always have the strength and the power. If something's keeping me away, away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I can say no to that. Thank you, Sayyid. Our next question is from our younger of viewers, and she's asking. Sorry, I'm like scrolling through. Um, did the Prophet have slaves? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had servants. Um, I'm not aware of the Prophet having slaves in his house, but he did have servants. For instance, Anas ibn Malik, he was one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who um, served the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, some of the wives of the Prophet were enslaved like Juwairiya. Juwairiya was enslaved, so she was brought to the Prophet, she was a slave. The Prophet freed her. The Prophet freed her, and then he told her, do you want to go back to your tribe? Or um, I would like to propose to you and, and you be my wife. She said, no, Ya Rasulullah, I believe in your message. I don't want to go back to my tribe. I'd like to be your wife. So the Prophet, you know, when he freed her, the people of Medina were so moved by this act, 200 slaves were freed that day in honor of Juwairiya. They said, if the Prophet freed a slave, then we're going to do it. So some of the wives of the Prophet, they were enslaved, but the Prophet pre freed them. Okay. Uh, that, I mean, you have a question connected to that as well. Like, what is the difference between a slave and a servant? Um, if you want to answer that right after. Yes, during those times, slavery existed all, all around the world. Basically, a slave was purchased. So a person would go to a slave market 
And by the way, when we say slave, it didn't mean just African slaves. No, a slave could come from any background. So slave owners would go to the market and they would sell their slaves. So a person would come buy that slave and they owned that slave. You own him like you would own property. And uh, basically you were responsible for that slave to, to give them a place to stay, to give them you know, food, but they, would have, they had to work for their masters. Now the religion of Islam came and put ways for these slaves to uh, be liberated. One way was Islam allowed slaves to buy themselves. If a slave gathered enough money, he could go to his master. He's like, here, I'm buying myself from you. I would be liberated. Um, the Islam, for instance, some kafaras. If someone deliberately breaks their fast, right? One of the kafara is to free a slave. So Islam encouraged people to free slaves as much as you can. Um, that way, gradually, Islam wanted to integrate them into society. Because if, if Islam on day one abolished slavery, abruptly those slaves would have suffered many of them were not educated they couldn't survive on their own so they would have basically died if that would have happened so islam wanted the masters to treat them well and gradually educate them and then uh free them now a servant is someone who's not owned by anyone a servant is a free person but he comes to serve you for for money but he can leave anytime Whereas a slave was owned by the person. Okay, inshallah, we have two more questions. Um, when Imam Zain al Abidin was sick in Karbala, what illness did he have? So the Imam السلام, had a severe fever. We don't know exactly what the cause of the fever was. Was it a flu? Was it an infection? But the Imam had such a severe fever that he could barely move. Um, maybe it was a very severe flu, Allahu a'la. Um, but, but, but the uh, symptom, the direct symptom was severe, severe fever. Okay, and our last question, inshallah, is part in Arabic. Ziyarat Ashura hiya hadith Qudsi. Ma ma'na dhalik? Who did it come down to? Hadith Qudsi means the words of Allah, but not the Quran. See, the Prophet and the Imams, they have many hadiths. They would teach us. But sometimes the Prophet would quote Allah. He would say, Allah says so and so. Not paraphrasing, but quoting the exact words of Allah. We call this hadith Qudsi. Now the Quran is also the words of Allah. But the Quran has a special status. So hadith Qudsi is any words that Allah said. And the Prophet told us about it, but it's not in the Quran. We call this Hadith Qudsi. We have many Hadith Qudsis and they're beautiful. You know, Allah is talking to us, Abdi, my dear servant, if you obey me, I'll give you such and such. For instance, Ziyarat Ashura, according to our Hadith, is a Hadith Qudsi, which means that the Ziyara was composed by Allah. These are the words of God. So the ziyara is not the words of the imam. He's composing them to do the ziyara. It's the words of Allah. He revealed them to Jibra'il, Jibra'il to the prophet, the prophet to the imams of Ahlul Bayt. And then an imam al-Sadiq is the one who taught his companions the ziyara. But he told them that these are not my words. I didn't compose the ziyara. These are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's what it means for it to be Hadith Qudsi. Whereas other ziyarahs, sometimes the Imam, he would compose it. He would go to the shrine and he would recite his own ziyarah. Which of course we also recite because the Imam is divinely inspired. But ziyarat Ashura, word for word, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters, it has been my honor to be with you this evening. May Allah bless you. May Allah protect you. And uh, I, I thank you all for your time. I thank the uh, organizers, a special thanks to the Farhat family for their dedication in organizing these programs. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.